Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I am Laura Carfang, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Breast Cancer Conversations. I am so excited to be here with you today because we have been getting a lot of questions and actually requests to talk about caregiving. We know that we focus so much on the patient or the person who's been diagnosed with breast cancer, but today I am pleased to have Abigail Johnson join me as well as our guest, Amy Dover. Amy is the founder of Caregiver's Guide to Cancer. She also is a co-host with her husband, Jose, on their podcast. And we will be linking to all of her great content and resources in the show notes below, as well as an upcoming blog. I love this conversation today because Amy gives us concrete tools, shares personal experiences, and tells stories of things that worked for her while she was trying to figure out the whole caregiving piece, things that sounded like a good idea at the time that ended up not being a good idea. Cue all of those casseroles that are still probably in your refrigerator or freezer at this point, plus so much more. So thank you, Amy, so much for being on today's show. Before we jump into the content, I want to remind everybody, if this is your first time listening to Breast Cancer Conversations, we are a podcast that is hosted by survivingbreastcancer.org. Hop on over to our website, survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events to find out about all of our upcoming programs, workshops, seminars, webinars, and you know everything that we have to offer. There's three things that you need in caregiving. One is a plan, two is a positive attitude, and three is good communication. Welcome to the conversation. And that brings us to our topic for today, which is caregiving. I'm sure that all of you have someone that you would tag as your caregiver. That might be a parent, that might be an adult child, that might be a partner, a spouse, a really, really, really good friend, uh, somebody who is with you every step of the way. And as I have found in the last five years, caregivers are not, um, they're not really noticed in a lot of ways. Uh, the doctor might say something, maybe if you're in a palliative or a hospice setting, there might be some services, but generally and genuinely, the, there's really not as much um, focus put on the caregivers. And that is why when I started following Amy and her husband, Jose, on Twitter, I was just overwhelmed at the wonderful resources that Amy has been posting. So Amy, thank you so much for being willing to talk about your experiences with caregiving and the resources that you've created. I am Amy Dover. I am thrilled, honored, and a little scared to be here today. Um, I found myself a caregiver um, having a new title last year. So we've been in the throes of cancer for a solid year last month. And, you know, Jose had a little cough and went to the doctor, got some antibiotics, sort of went away and came back with a vengeance, started the process of discovery, more doctor's appointments Mm. um, until we got that diagnosis. And immediately we didn't even have to go into biopsy mode for the diagnosis that he, he knew from the scans it was stage four. That's how serious it was. I mean, as soon as the doctor saw Jose, he said that you're going to the hospital today. Um, it, it just escalated so fast and it rocked our world in so many ways that we just were not ready for. And I know that when I say these things, I am not special. I am preaching to a choir. And like, but that is why I had to activate because There was no guidance. Cancer is not new. There's almost 200 different types of cancers. These cancer centers have been in business for a long time. Our oncologist is aging. He's been doing this for a long time. I didn't understand why I didn't get some sort of a guidebook or a brochure, a pamphlet, a worksheet, a checklist. Girl, I got nothing, nothing. Now, did Jose, did Jose get a, a big binder of all the things to expect with chemo and side no. effects? And things? No, he didn't either. Oh, wow. Okay. No. Like, when I tell you that our experience was horrific to start, it really was. So it was horrific to us, although the doctor meant well in some parts of it, but it really kind of screwed up our system. Mm. Um, 
he was fighting to get Jose into a trial, but had not communicated that to us, nor his staff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so um, our, our system got all messed up. He meant well, I'll give him some credit, like he, he totally meant well. Um, but we had our chemo, our first chemo appointment scheduled. And I literally sat there and said, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know what to expect. How long is he here for? Can he bring food? Can he go to the bathroom? I don't know these things. Jose doesn't know these things. We went from healthy to stage four. What do you do? And he said, well, you haven't gotten your, your meeting, your appointment. And I'm like, no, (laughs) no, we haven't gotten anything other than we know he's going to sit in the chair on Friday. Particular to Jose and his treatment, he had to get an immune boost shot within 24 hours. And so some patients and some insurances cover this little patch that gets attached to you. And in 24 hours, you automatically get this shot in your arm. Well, Jose's insurance didn't pay for that. So we went in on Thursday, like it was, it was crazy. But when we went on on Thursday, he said, uh, there's a little problem. Your insurance won't pay for that. So in order to get your shot 24 hours later, you have to have chemo right now. So although we knew it was tomorrow, we were still like shocked, not prepared for right now, still didn't know what was going on. And I mean, it's just such a frightening experience. And I don't live in a space of fear very often. I mean, go through your emotions. I'm, I'm a big proponent of feel what you feel. Go through it. You're entitled to it. It's part of the process. Don't sit in it. And I just found myself being so fearful when this process was not new. So why are we treating people this way? When I say this, like the average age of cancer is 20 years older than I am. So when yeah. you think about the average age of a person going through cancer, you think of technology, you think of what they have to do and discover on their own. It's yeah. not right. It's, it's just, it's not right. We are able-bodied. We are, you know, I'd like to think that we're somewhat intelligent <laughs> and tech technologically savvy. This is what we do for a living. So just looking around in that room and knowing that if I felt this way, yeah. my goodness, how do these people feel? And how do we have the, the audacity to continue to do this every day? You run a business doing this every day. It blew so my did, mind. Did you have that conversation with the doctor at any point? Oh, honey, you haven't really met me. I had the conversation (laughs) with the doctor, the office manager, her boss, her boss's boss, and her boss's boss. And I literally sat in that room with those women, and I said, he is stage four. There is not a stage five. We don't have the time for this. I was not having it. I just was not having it. A lot of patients are so overwhelmed and their families are so overwhelmed that a lot of times these businesses never get that feedback, right? The people are experiencing that, but they're so, you know, I I certainly was during the headlights. What what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? Fine. I'll do it because you're, you're afraid you're going to die right away. Or you're afraid that your, your loved one is going to die. But I'm so glad that you, you reflected back to them what the actual experience was. I think a lot of times the doctor's offices we deal with, they get disconnected from that reality. It's, it's their life, it's their job, they're doing it every day and they forget the constituency, what, what you're actually experiencing. You know, when you're dealing with cancer, the last thing you need to deal with is trying to figure it all out. Because now yes. you're an expert in cancer, you're an expert in diet, dietary needs, you're an expert in insurance. And listen, we're not experts in any of these things. But somehow we have to wrangle our resources and really try to figure out how to get there. The, the way that I discovered how to get into the hospital and how to advocate on Jose's behalf on a different level, like I'll stand on somebody's desk and advocate, I, but I'm coming in. We're going to talk about this. Uh, <laughs> but I have the best group of girlfriends. And one of my girlfriend's husband worked at the hospital. And so she gave me a phone number and said, 
this is not acceptable. I can tell you that my husband does not operate this way. That's not the standard of the hospital. We're going to get you to, in to talk to somebody. And oh. that's where my level of caregiving support started to happen. I didn't even know that I needed my girlfriend that way. Mm. And you know, like as we, I started to build these resources and things, I don't have support groups. Uh, like I, I don't lead them up for caregivers guide to cancer. I don't lead them. I don't talk about a lot of medical things. I don't talk about insurance. I'm not that person. We're not that space. What really hit my heart was the caregiver and all of the support that they need in order to be the support to the patient. And so that's that's the foundation of all of this. And my girlfriends from book club of all things, like they're, they're just amazing. And they're what really made me realize that I needed support and that we need to get caregivers in a position for maintaining their own health in many facets, mental yes. health, physical health, emotional health, and support them in that foundation. Yes, the idea that you can't pour from an empty cup. Exactly. Just like when you're on an airplane and they tell you to put on your oxygen mask first before helping others around you. My goodness. My best piece of life advice is find a group of girlfriends like that. <laughs> Just find a group of girlfriends that activate. Oh, totally. We all need a good group of girlfriends. So tell me how you got started with the Caregiver's Guide. Well, we started a podcast. I thought that would be a good outlet for me. Um, I have learned along the way that I can write about it. I can create packages, resources, uh, all the social media. I can write. I don't love talking about it, right? So uh, the podcast actually wasn't the best thing for me to do, but uh, what it did do for me and for Caregiver's Guide to Cancer was give me a platform and a little bit of a leg to stand on to share that experience. So I'm a business strategist. My, my specialty is operations and project management. So I take big problems and pare them down into smaller solutions, get a plan in place and make stuff happen. That's what I do for a living. So when I, <laughs> that fits, right? You're laughing, that fits. <laughs> the hospital should hire you, like legitimately, they should just hire you to fix their problems. <laughs> I told them that. <laughs> I'm sure you did, I'm sure you did. <laughs> so, uh, the way that my brain functions and the way that I feel most useful and organized is when I'm problem solving. That's just me as a person. And so this was a really big problem in my life. And it really, honestly, aside from, from Jose, because these resources aren't really helping me at the moment. Mm. I mean, they're, they're not really for me. I've gone through this and am continuing and I'm, I'm equipped with enough tools to know these things. Um, now, sometimes knowing them and doing them are two different things, but they, they, they weren't built for me because just seeing the impact, seeing the other people in the waiting room, seeing what others mm -hmm. are going through across the nation, across the world, really, um, through social media, it's, to me, I just find it unacceptable and it's heartbreaking. And if there's anything that I can do in any capacity, I need to show up. What was your first tool that you put in your toolkit? I know a lot of people, especially in our breast cancer world, were always talking about gratitude journals. Did you include that? I did. I created a gratitude journal because uh, I found myself needing a little bit of an attitude adjustment on a regular basis. <laughs> and I like I call it that, but it's just a reset, right? But because it's easy to go down that line of, oh, okay, well, I have all of this on my plate and it's easy to just be fearful because you don't know. It's, it's mm -hmm. easy to just sit in that space. And I don't like to sit there for very long. So I kind of just looked at all of the ways that um, I like to remind myself to be present mm -hmm. and put that book, well, little booklet really together um, of how to stop and have gratitude. And the gratitude journal itself, I mean, yeah, you can use it to journal. There's a 30-day prompt of things to just sit and remind yourself of every single day. You get something new to look for in the space that is around you because there's still so many beautiful things around you, mm -hmm. even in the midst of this. And, you know, it's 
it's what we need to keep going. We cannot sit in that space for very long. I know that I can't. It, everyone is different. So, uh, but it's it's just that reset. So the the gratitude journal is it's on the website caregiversguidecancer.com. Everything that's on that website is absolutely free. Uh, we don't. We didn't put this out here to charge anyone for anything. It's all free resources. Um, download it, print it out, do a couple of the worksheets, print out the 30 day guide, put it on your refrigerator. And when you feel in the funk, pick today on that calendar and be like, okay, this is what I'm going to look for today. And I'm going to give myself a little attitude adjustment. <laughs> <laughs> Just reset your day. So important. I mean, everybody talks about how, you know, and, and, and sometimes it gets into toxic positivity, but, you know, we talk about how having a, a good outlook or a outlook or a positive attitude or, or just hope generally that, mm -hmm. that it does improve the ability to live with something that is so difficult. But how do you guard against the people who are, you know, just think positive and, you know, you're, you're so strong and you're going to get through it. How do you get through that as a caregiver? I think the difference in that what's toxic positivity and just being positive is acknowledging the fact that your attitude isn't going to change the outcome of the prognosis, but it can change the outcome of right now. So, you know, I'm not telling anyone that positivity or gratitude is going to change a cancer diagnosis. It's not. I wish it was. Uh, I'd give that away. I'd sprinkle it like fairy dust, but it's not. But it might allow you to press pause on what you're going through at that moment just reset and then become more present because caregivers are needed and our job yeah. does not stop. So you have the ability to everyone, regardless of cancer, regardless of caregiving, every single person has the ability to impact the room that they are in. And you can choose so to be a light in that room or you can choose to be a fungus that grows in the corner. And <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I mean, it's that fungus needs to be cleaned up. Yeah. And it, you know, again, it's feel it, feel it as you need to feel it. Just don't sit in it any longer than you absolutely need to. One of the things you talk about a lot is food. And the yeah. battle with food when you have a um, someone that you're care caring for who just feels really crappy and doesn't want to eat anything, but you as the caregiver know that your loved one needs food. Um, so tell me a little bit about the resources that you create around that because I've loved the stuff that you've shared on Twitter about that issue. I have tried, and I think the the tip in all of this is try all the things. Don't get dead set on one way or this is how I make dinner or I grew up with the mentality of eat what's on your plate or don't eat at all. Like that, none of that stuff works. None of it works. So uh, we've tried a few things. Um, I was very fortunate in the sense that my, my community around us pitched in and we got what we called a house helper. I don't know what else to call her, but we got a house helper who came in once a week for about three, four hours. She cleaned up and she uh, made some simple, ready to go meals for us. Nice. In theory, in theory, <laughs> it was fantastic. It was so wrong. <laughs> it was so wrong. Okay. Um, because she came in and she made these great casseroles. She made like three or four casseroles in, you know, the few hours that she was there so that we would have meals throughout the week. Jose would need them. I ate those casseroles, breakfast, lunch, and dinner until they were gone. I was like, I am, I'm not eating another casserole. <laughs> oh, no. so, and, but that just didn't work. It was great in theory. We tried it. Um, one of the things that did work for us was just constantly having protein in the refrigerator ready to go. So we always had chicken or ground turkey or ground beef, or I would buy uh, big pot roasts. And then whatever else he could eat alongside it, then I was just cooking side dishes throughout the week that are easier to get together than worrying about what to cook 
and I almost never really cooked um, that the protein on that day. It was always heat up the protein, make some side dishes, whatever he felt like he could eat. And that really helped us. Um, protein shakes really helped us a lot. Um, he, he drinks some protein shake more than I would care to drink. Um, do you order them from a specific source or do you make them? He makes them. He orders the protein powder and then he makes them. Okay. Okay. And that's I couldn't tell that's what it is. That, that's definitely an option. I'll just throw out there that I order mine from Kate Farms, which has a vegan option for protein. And it's, they're basically meal replacement. It, they also mm -hmm. make the stuff that goes into a um, into feeding tubes. So it's, it's a wide variety of um, great nutrients. And it has the most protein of any protein shake I've ever seen. It has 21 grams of protein in each meal, meal replacement shake. So I found that out from a nutritionist at the cancer center who I finally got referred to after like four years of, of going there. So um, it's amazing that there are these resources that happen because you ask for them, not because someone says, maybe maybe you're losing weight and maybe it's a good idea. So anyway, sorry, back back to you, Amy. <laughs> we never saw a dietitian. We, uh, mm. we never... I don't even know that the cancer center had one at that point. I, I know that they do now just in me raising pain to try to figure it out. Like I know that they do now. I think that was a new hire for them. Uh, but those things are, are so important. And it's what gets me about the whole process is the cancer centers in the hospitals, they're charged with treating cancer and they're, they're, I mean, 100% all in. Our doctor was all in advocating for a trial, advocating for the best medicine, fighting with the insurance company, and that's the last thing that that doctor needs to be doing. I mean, he was he was on our team. But Jose spends more time with me. Why am I not being equipped? Yes. Why is no one talking to me about nutrition or or you know what to look for? What are some of the signs? I don't know these things and. WebMD and the Google, man, they're scary. Yes. And so give me the, the ins and the outs and the realistic of it. Like if you read the, the, the side effects and the potential things that could go wrong with a bottle of Tylenol, nobody would take Tylenol. So imagine chemo. I mean, Tylenol scary. Have you read the bottle of, of, of Tylenol? Oh, there are so many side effects for everything or potential side effects. You're right. Right. But that just adds more fear and anxiety yeah. and overwhelm. And then, you know, you become hyper vigilant and it, it just stresses you out for no reason. When they know what's most likely, tell me what the most likely are. Let's have a really good conversation about how I can identify those as a caregiver and then send us home. That's what we're looking for. That's what did, I'm asking for. Did the did the nurses end up doing that after after you were asking those questions when you were at the chemo infusion center? Not really. Um, mm. We we got a really good trial nurse. Uh, so the trial drug when we were going through that process, she was fantastic on that side. Um, but our trial didn't work for us, and. And then there was another stage and then another stage and then a stem cell transplant. You know, we're on our third. We've had three different types of chemo cocktails. Mm -hmm. And in two months, he starts his fourth different chemo cocktail. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's there's room for improvement on that front for sure. Well, that, it, that and that is similar with those of us in the NBC community that we go through different lines of treatment. Some of those are chemo. Some of those are targeted meds and the the profile, the side effects, the things to look for, everything changes every time. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a process of getting adjusted um, every time. So ha have you have you refined your process now of getting adjusted each time you switch over to another line of treatment or another chemo? A little bit. And mostly that is I don't listen to Jose anymore. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, tell me more about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's he's optimistic with a lot of things, and that is 
a huge blessing and a wonderful character trait. Um, but that false sense of optimism, uh, I can't live in that space anymore after the cancer came back. Mm -hmm. right? So we heard the word remission two months mm -hmm. after we started treatments. And doctor just said, okay, you have four more months of treatments, just get through it. This is the chemo, just to make sure that it's gone and you're on your way. We rang the bell. A month later, at a scan, and it's back. And it's back growing fast. So I don't allow myself to live in that space anymore. I'm, I'm a little more hyper vigilant because I'll tell you that when the doctor came in um, to give us the, the results of the scans, we were laughing. He literally interrupted us sitting in the, the waiting room or the, the patient room uh, laughing. We were chatting. We were laughing. We just knew that we were just getting our card. We were getting out here. Like, well, that was it. And that, that kind of rocked my world. So now I just pay a little more attention. And um, I, I have that conversation with him differently now. So I spearhead that conversation, whereas before I would just sit and wait and listen for him to complain or maybe there's a limp because the neuropathy is, is worse, so you're, you're, you're looking for it. But I would always just, I trusted it. I trusted him, not that I don't trust him, I do, but I trusted him to say when something was wrong. And now I don't trust it. Now I just look for it in a different way. Sometimes how we as patients live and how we have to live in order to keep going might be very different from where our caregivers have to live in terms of what they're looking at or what they're looking for. Um, I'll tell you, my husband has noticed symptoms that I was not paying attention to as well. So having somebody to be you use the word hypervigilant, but somebody to be vigilant and somebody to keep an eye out for things is important. But I want to come back to your relationship and, and how being a caregiver versus just, and I'm putting that in quotations, just a <laughs> wife. Um, but, but how has that changed your relationship with your husband as you've had to make that adjustment to be more of a caregiver, more vigilant? Um, and, and I'm assuming that's changed your relationship, but... It has, it definitely has. And, you know, I have to press pause sometimes and remember that we still in, are in a relationship as two people, not just we have cancer. And, and I use the word we, I don't have cancer, but this household has been rocked by cancer. And it's, it's very different, you know, and I, I'll say this, I don't know, I mean, women who are going through breast cancer and having physical body changes, I cannot even imagine. I cannot even imagine. I know that that has to have an impact on a relationship because we don't have physical body changes and it's had an impact on the relationship because I get into that caregiver mode, not the partner mode, not, um, not that let's have a loving moment instead of, oh God, I just need to breathe, you know, and I'm not fitting that in as often as I should and remembering to do the fun things and to, to be that partner in a different way. I'm I, not just be a partner in cancer, but be a partner in life. And that really, Jose's good about it. He's great about it. He, he flips it on, flips it off. Like he just like, okay, let's go. And <laughs> I don't, flip it on and flip it off that fast. And um, I just have to remind myself to get into that space and not get lost in this because it is easy. It is so easy to get lost in this. So what do you, do you remind yourself in other ways other just than kind of a mental note? Um, are, are there tips or tricks that you could offer to, to caregivers so, when they feel like they're getting too into caregiver mode and not just a person to person relationship? Yeah, so uh, we go for walks together. That's kind of our thing. And um, both of us will do this. If, if it's been a funky kind of day or one of us needs an attitude adjustment, it's like, okay, well, go put your, walk, your running shoes on. Let's go for a walk. Go put your sneakers on. 
and that helps us to reset. And we live in a beautiful area, and so it, you can't help it. I mean, you honestly can't help it because you get across the street, and there's water, and it just, the weight starts to lift a little bit, and then you start to communicate. Right? So sitting in the house or coming in for work or a client meeting or whatever, wherever you're coming from, you're coming into the same chaos sometimes you're coming into the same situation and so separating yourself from that environment really helps us and that would probably be the biggest piece of advice that I could give is separate yourself as much as you can go for a walk around the block drive to the park if you're near a beach or a river go see the water Uh, it's I mean, go give that gratitude journal because that it, it honestly has those prompts in it of what are you looking for? Where's the, is there a flower nearby? How do you reset and not just reset by yourself, but reset with your partner? And for us, it's it's going for a walk. That's that's great advice just to get out of the situation too a little bit. I know a lot of people have said that the um, you know the relationship has to fundamentally change in a lot of ways because the person who is ill is no longer the person that the spouse can not dump on, but you know, the, the, the ability of the person with cancer is no longer the same in terms of lifting their partner up. And how has that played out in your relationship with Jose and how have you dealt with that as a caregiver? So I I would say the hardest part for me in that situation is he is that sounding board. He is that safe place to where if I've had a bad day, I'm like, oh, and I come home and I tell him. And it's, and I still do tell him a little bit. But the things that are most frustrating are not work. It's not the neighbors. It's, it's the cancer. So I certainly can't dump on him about the cancer. And to me, it's I have to make sure that I have a space to where I can tell my girlfriend sometimes. I can just walk away, go have a conversation with my girlfriend and come back to that. It's difficult because he is that trusted person for me. And I can't complain to him about, okay, I gotta rearrange my schedule because the doctor's office screwed up and I've gotta go to the, the, the doctor's office today. That's happened. Um, and so it's, yeah, you're closing in an hour and a half. We gotta be there before an hour and a half. And you know, that's frustrating, but his care comes first. So it just I would say the best piece of advice that I can give in that situation is find, find your external support. That may be somebody that is in existence now. It may be on social media. It may be in a support group. Find what works for you. There's no like magic sauce recipe. Everyone is different. And guess what? Sometimes you need different things at different times. So be Mm. willing to change and move into a new space as you as a human are moving into a new space because you need that support. So that makes a lot of sense, but, but how would a caregiver go about finding those different methods of support? Is it just trial and error you think, or um, where would be a good place to start if a caregiver says, oh, wait a minute, I do need more support than I'm getting? So inside the caregiver action plan that I have, I, I kind of walk through going through local support services and national, regional support services. Uh, some of it is trial and error. Some of it going to the, the, the big shops, right? Go to cancer.org, go to lls.org. And you know what? Call that 1-800 number that's on that website. I tell folks, talk to a human because you don't know what you don't know. And you can go down a rabbit hole on the World Wide Web so fast and still so not true. find anything that you're looking for. Yes. So I, <laughs> it's true. I've wasted lots of hours and still got nowhere fast. Mm-hmm. And so honestly, you know, I walk through where those resources are, um, your churches, your if you're a veteran, some veteran services are available to you. Um, your, uh, let's see, 
the, the pages that we have are a lot about what's in your backyard. Like what organizations are you even a member of? How do you get tapped into, maybe it's your chamber. How, are you a business owner? Maybe the chamber has some resources or some grants that you could apply for that will lessen the stress so that you can turn around and focus. So it's, it's different for everyone, but it's about taking stock of where you are, what are you, what are you tied to? What organizations are your, is your husband tied to? What organizations is your company tied to? Um, who does this for a living? Who, who's out there that's focused on single mothers with breast cancer? Who's out there that's focused on uh, blood cancers? And just start to dig in a little bit deeper. There isn't a magic sauce. I swear I wish I could give it to you. <laughs> Trust we need me. it. We need that. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, but it's it's really just taking stock of, of where you are right now and that one of the biggest things is telling people what you need. They don't know. They don't know what you need. And I'll, I'll tell you, it, I had never really dealt with cancer like this intimately ever. And so it's hard to let people into your real life. You know, it's just Jose and I behind these doors. And it's hard to let people in and say, I need something. But they don't know. And so you don't know who stands behind them. Just like with my book club, I didn't know that she would give me a resource because there's so many people that stand behind her. Yes. Yes. And take stock of, of where you are. Take stock of who you're connected to and then share. You don't have to ask for anything. Just share. And it may be a book club. Who knows? Who you don't knows? know where the magic is going to happen. The other thing I would say too, which is we have found is to make those lists and do those things when there is not a crisis. Because yeah. if you're in the middle of a crisis, not only do you might, your brain power is so focused on the crisis that you're not going to be able to be able to articulate those things as well. So when you're in a, a lull, when you're in a time where you're not in a crisis, that's a good time to make those lists. Um, I wanted to add another resource, the Caregiver Action Network. And uh, Laura will share a, a meme that um, Jen O'Brien, the hospice doctor's, the author of The Hospice Doctor's Widow, uh, she put out a, they have a confidential help desk and, um, and then they have a, a website as well, but very focused on um, supporting caregivers. And it's a helpline you can call in the middle of the night. Um, because there are those crises, right? There are those times where you're, you're at the end of your rope and you just need to talk to someone. So um, sometimes you might not have the, the bench or the resources to be able to do that on an emergency basis. And that's where finding organizations that have those resources is so helpful. But checklists are so nice. And Amy has created some of those. What other checklists do you have in your, uh, your resources, Amy? So going back to my brain functions in planning and doing that in a non-crisis manner, um, really taking a, an assessment of, of what your family needs and getting clear on what that takes. How often do you mow the grass? You know, do you have young kids that are in sports or, or activities at school? What times are those? Who can give rides? And really start to build that. Uh, one of the things that, that we have in there in the, the action plan and the self-care planner is some scenarios about how to tell people what you need without going into great detail because everybody does not need to know all your business. <laughs> and <laughs> they don't need to know it all. They just need to know what's imminent. And if they are willing to help, they'll step into it. And mm -hmm. You know, really putting that calendar out, share, share as much as you feel comfortable with, share, create a Facebook group or a page for your family members to just get connected. There are lots of um, like meal train pages where if you just put, you know, Katie's soccer schedule on the meal train and say she needs rides at 
the gay men's at 7.30 every Thursday who can pick Katie up. That's such a great reminder that Meal Train isn't just meals, right? It's still yeah. MealTrain.com, but you can do all kinds of things on, on Meal Train. So that's a great reminder. And then people sign up, and then you don't have to remind them. Right. Train it does it for them. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, just letting people know, I think the reason why so many caregivers get stuck in this doing it themselves and burnout is because they don't share enough. And people are willing to help, but they don't know how to step into your shoes and run your household. So you have to tell them how to best help. And I, I, I get annoyed with um, when people say, uh, let me know if you need anything. That's oh, not a question. I hate that That's one not too. a question. <laughs> I'm like, hold on, girl, I got a list. I need a lot of stuff. <laughs> like, do you mean it? <laughs> because, um, yeah, I got a lot of things going on and we need support. And every cancer patient and their caregivers need support. Uh, and in that support, like when we talk about that, that needs assessment and what's going on, what to track, there's symptom trackers that we, you know, you can print these things out appointment trackers, information about insurance and stuff like that. I think that a lot of us really kind of get into that mode of I'll do it all. I know it's my it's my child. It's my husband. It's my wife. I will do it. But when other people need to step into that space for you and activate on your behalf, they need to be equipped with the resources that you know. That's mm -hmm. where a lot of confusion comes into place. So I have a lot of uh, checklists, a lot of information sheets that, you know, print it out, put it in a little folder, keep it on the, count, on the counter, and everyone who steps into your household in that caregiving capacity, because they're all caregivers at that moment, mm -hmm. uh, they are your support team, they are equipped with what you know and how to best activate. And that's wow. A that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, it's to me, I like, I know what Jose's going through. I, I know, and I haven't had anyone step in in, a, in more of a caregiving capacity, but my goodness, we don't have young children either. So imagine having a young child or someone who's coming in to bring dinner, you know, know what the children are allergic to, put a family binder together and, you know, make sure that everyone knows if you're creating a Facebook group, this is what we like. This is what we don't like. Be very clear on those things. It's not being picky. It's not being ungrateful. It's just the last thing you want to fight over is meal time because we're going to do enough of that. Very true. And, and meal train, not to harp on meal train, but meal train does allow you to put in allergies and like favorite restaurants and, and things like that. Uh, so there are those resources like that out there. Um, which is great. Do, did you find, Amy, that at your cancer center that there was a social worker that helped with any of these things? No. No. They didn't have one on staff. Okay. So um, we, I called the, I, I went on the LLS website because we have lymphoma. So it's, for us, it's LLS more than, than cancer.org. Um, I went onto the site and just started digging around. I asked for, um, a consult because I don't know what I don't know. I just, I, mm -hmm. I'm that kind of person that I, I want to speak to a human because they do this every day and they yeah. can pull out the things in my conversation that I don't even know I need or the gaps mm -hmm. in the coverage that I'm not even aware of. So I'm a huge advocate of if there's a phone number on a website, call them, call. They do this for a living. They know more about this than you do, and they're not going to they're not going to have all the answers. But even that slightest bit of guidance of, OK, here's your next step in your information yeah. chain. That's so valuable. Absolutely. So don't hide at home. Don't think you've got it all. You don't. You don't know this stuff. Speak to other humans who do this for a living and they're going to point you in, in different directions. You know, they may point you to a support group. If you don't like that support group, leave it. Go to another one. Some of it, you asked that question earlier. I don't think I answered it well. That everything is not for everybody, but it yes. doesn't make it all wrong. 
Mm-hmm. Some support groups are not for you. Some are, they're too heavy or they're not, they're not deep enough. It, it just depends on where you are and don't be afraid to leave it. You're not obligated to be there. If you're not active on social media, don't feel bad. Do what you need to do in that moment and don't be afraid to try new things. That's, that's how you get through it because Honestly, there are so many stages of this. You don't sit in the same stage of emotions or needs or, right. or your, your relationships. You don't sit in the same stage for very long. So what worked for you in one stage may not work for you in another. So what advice do you have for those of us who are living with the disease, who see our caregivers begin to struggle? I would say go through that needs assessment in your household. Do that together and have things that are on the ready on the top of your on your mind so that when someone says, let me know if you need anything or do you need anything? I like it better when it's phrased as a question. Do you need anything? The answer, You know the answer. It's not that, yeah, she, we're overwhelmed. Yeah, we could use a day out. No, be very, very specific. People react to things that are specific because, again, they don't know how to step into your household. So at you as the patient, if you see that your caregiver is struggling, you know, be ready when someone asks you. Be very specific and be ready. And then I I think we had talked about this before. um, What do you do when your caregiver is a little resistant to, uh, to new things or maybe they're not thinking a support group is for them. I would say, you know, look up those resources and just have them available. Don't force anything, but have them available so that when you're ready, that's that's one of the reasons why that we create so many resources on different platforms so that it's available when you are ready. No one can decide when you're ready or how you're going to best receive content or support. So having it available so that they can touch it at any time, uh, it's, it's so important, so important. Yeah, having that, that hotline number on the refrigerator or mm-hmm. um, you know, printing out those, those resources and just leaving them in their office or setting out where they can easily access them that way when it's time. Um, I think that one of the things I notice in the NBC community is that the vast majority of the caregivers are men. Certainly we have many sisters in the LGBTQ um, community who have same sex caregivers, but it's by and large mostly men and men don't join support groups as much as women do generally. Um, So that, that does seem to be a bit of a hurdle for some of our husbands, but knowing that there are resources out there, knowing that there are places for them to go is so very, very important. Um, Ahead, Honestly, sorry. take those calls together. Mm. Take them together because you, the patient, just like we know, we can see your symptoms in a different way. You can see our symptoms in a different way sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so when you call those 1 800 numbers together, you can ask questions that they're not going to ask, but you know they need to hear the answer to. Ooh, that's great advice. So do that together, and then you can just slip those questions in so they hear it. (laughs) Well, the thing is, is that any kind of crisis, trauma, cancer diagnosis is going to change your relationship. Yeah. And so what outside of walks, outside of, you know, reconnecting on a human to human level, um, how, how do you and Jose keep your relationship strong as husband and wife? So we talk a lot. Um, (laughs) We are not afraid and we just have that open relationship to where we're not afraid to say, I need a minute and creating that safe space to where that's not stomping on somebody's feelings or making them feel unvalidated to just say, okay, listen, when I say this, this is what I really need. And this is what I really need. I don't want you to receive it in a different way. I don't want you to get your feelings hurt from it. And just setting the expectation for qualifying what's happening at that moment. It's easy to get your feelings hurt in this process because, you know, he's in pain. He's, you know, 
he's grumpy in this way, like, or, or I wake up tired and I'm grumpy in that way. And uh, like last night, I fell asleep on the couch and I woke up, went to go to bed and I looked at him. He's like, why are you looking at me like that? I was like, don't take it personal. I'm just tired. I'm grumpy. And I'm ready to go to bed. <laughs> and, but if you wake me up in the middle of the night, I'm going to be grumpy. Don't take it personal. But say those things. Don't just know them. Say them out loud. So if you wake me up and I'm grumpy, I'm sorry. I will apologize to you. I don't mean it. Please don't take it personal. And that will level the expectation a little bit differently so that they know to move on from that grumpiness a little bit faster and not hold on to it. Because the last thing you need is to hold on to things that will create rifts in your in your relationship or rifts in your day that y'all just don't need. You just don't need that. So that's great advice. Absent cancer anyway. That's just great advice. <laughs> relationship advice. <laughs> I mean, but that's that's what it is. So you're looking at your relationship in a different way and you have to set those expectations in a different way. Uh, you know, or I recently, uh, since the pandemic, I've, we've worked from home. Right? We had office space before the pandemic. We shut it down. We were paying six months worth of rent. Nobody was coming into the office. Ooh. Like, oh. yeah. Right. No. Talk to the landlord. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We don't know when we're getting out of it. We have to conserve, shut the office down. Well, this week I went and got office space. And that was something. That's a big that step. I, it is. It is. It's something that I needed to do. And I had to literally say, I don't mean to leave you alone, but I need to be alone. So setting that expectation of I'm not trying to escape from you or I'm not so overwhelmed by you or the situation that we're currently going through, but I still have our business to run. I still have people that are depending upon me and clients that I need to show up for everyone in the best capacity. And that means I have to get out of the house. And that means that, okay, things might be a little bit tighter right now because I just added more expenses to the household and people who are going through cancer know that we got a lot of expenses. Oh, yes, that's true. But that's something that I needed and I had to, I had to say that in a way that didn't hurt his feelings to say that I'm, I'm leaving you or I'm, I'm running away from this. But leveling that expectation of, I still have obligations. We have to find a balance in this household so that, you know, I can maintain my business. I can maintain client expectations. I can get all of this done. That, that open line of communication, you know, we talk about there's two, or sorry, there's three things that you need in caregiving. One is a plan. Two is a positive attitude. And three is good communication. And that has just really been what we live by in general. So, insert cancer we just have to do it in a different way but those are that's that's what we're living by amy and abigail this is just as always fabulous information and such amazing takeaways so amy thank you so much for being a guest on our podcast sharing your story and how you and jose are really activating communicating and providing all of these great resources to those in our breast cancer community, actually in all cancer communities, because you said it earlier, you know, cancer is not new. Caregiving is not new. You just put it all together in a great caregiver's guide to cancer. So thank you again for being a guest on our show. And thank you all for listening and tuning in week after week here on Breast Cancer Conversations. Please be mindful that all of our content and information is for educational purposes only and is never a substitute for medical advice. If you want to hang out again, please check out survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events, where you can RSVP to our Thursday Night Thrivers weekly meetup, our Movement Monday classes, workshops, seminars, and so much more. We can also continue the dialogue online via social media. Our Instagram handle is survivingbreastcancer.org, all one word, and you can follow us on Twitter at SBC underscore ORG. Until next time, keep on thriving.